Today, I'm going to do a Q&A video about pressurized fermentation. I have been brewing under pressure for almost like three years now. And of course, as my channel is one of the channels that has most content about pressurized fermentation, I've gotten a lot of questions during the years about pressurized fermentation. So I've gathered a lot of questions here today and uh, I will answer them as good as I can. And before you start typing like crazy down here, linking to other channel and what other peeps are saying on forums, hear me out. I didn't start this channel to like parrot anyone else. The whole idea of this channel is that it's supposed to be a learning channel for me together with the viewers. So the thing I'm sharing here is after a lot of pressurized fermentation, the things I've learned from trial and error. So before you said, on this channel he said that, that fine, he says that and I've heard that people are saying things and re I read things, but yeah, I'm gonna share here what my experiments have taught me about pressurized fermentation. So, let's get into that. I'm Dr. Hans, this is Dr. Hans Brewery, my channel about beer and home brewing. So if you want to learn with me how to become better at beer and brewing beer, Consider becoming a subscriber. Before we kick off the questions, I need a beer. And uh, yeah, spoiler alert, one of the pros of fermenting under pressure is that you can do this. Here we have a beer straight out of the fermenter. This is one of my session NEPA experiments, which ended as a Dr. Hans beer kit. And yes, I did talk about my kit, got some complaints about that. But if you have the chance, like I have, to release some Dr. Hans beer kits, wouldn't you talk about them on your YouTube channel? Or else, yeah, be my guest through the first stone. And yeah, speaking of the beer kits, today's sponsor, Brewgoat. Thank you very, very much. And yeah, I'm gonna talk about them a little bit later into this video. This is very, very cold now. This Napa is 3.7%. And uh, what I've learned so far about the brewing of this is that I prefer the one that was a little bit stronger. Cheers. But it is nice though. It is nice. Not as nice as the one in the beer kit. Yeah, I've talked about that in another video link down below. It's going to be a lot of links down below to the other videos and of course also today's sponsor Brewgoat. Don't peek at my pin code. First question, what's the benefit of fermenting under pressure? I have an iPad here, okay? So I'm glancing at that. There's a lot of benefits from fermenting under pressure. One you saw right now. Uh, the big benefit is that it's very easy to keep oxygen out of your beer and so easy doing seal transfers. So that would be the, the main benefit, I think, of fermenting under pressure. Of course, you can also end up with a carbonated beer. That's another benefit. And uh, another one is that you can brew faster, can, you can really push up the temperature. So that's a quick answer for that question. Question number two, what's the con of pressure fermentation? Um, you need some gear, should be that. I don't, don't found any like cons. Yeah, you need to buy stuff. I guess that's it. Why buy plastic when there's stainless steel? Um, stainless steel cost more, of course, and they will last longer, of course, but it's a quite of an investment. Most of them also have a lot of more parts, so much more cleaning, I would say. Of course, I would love one, they look really cool, but they are expensive. One thing I like about like the bubbles is that you can see through them, of course. You need to be aware of uh, keeping them out of sunlight. Next question, I'm new to home brewing, should I buy a fermented source? Quick answer, no. Longer answer, you could if you wanted to, but uh, yeah, maybe you should start with 
something simple like a bucket and learn the way. But yeah, um, the thing with a fermentosaurus or, or like a fermcilla is that you could, if you have a fridge, you could, like I did here, ferment and serve it straight out of there. You could even bottle carbonated beer straight out over the, the vessel. So yeah, it's really, really cool, but uh, it is an investment and maybe you could instead buy a fridge, uh, something like that before getting into to that. But yeah, you spend your money your way. Do I need a spawning valve or could I just use the RV? Um, do you need a spawning valve? The RV is just an, another safety precaution. So yeah, do get a spawning valve if you want to ferment under pressure. And my favorite spawning valve is the Spandit. Try to link down below to that. Next question. Doesn't your beer get over carbon ferments at 2.4 bar or 35 psi? I ferment higher than most people do. And the quick answer to that, no, my beer don't get overcarbed from the high pressure because I ferment at a higher temperature. Should we like check this out really closely? For most lagers, I do finish at like 25 C most of the times and at 2.4 bars that would give 2.6 volumes of CO2 and uh, yeah, that's good. And if we do like more what I do for ales, I do end up like at 30 degrees. And that would give us something like 2.3, 2.3 volumes of CO2. So we're at a good place there and you can tweak that from there with different temperatures and different bars, but yeah, so no, your beers won't get overcarbed from that. I've heard that fermentation over 1 to 1.5 bar would inhibit the yeast. Yes, I've heard that too, but I've never noticed it. So, uh, and uh, that's just the thing I think that are going from mouth to mouth. I read some stuff about that and um, when I started out, because uh, I did want to learn before uh, and also bought the special uh, high pressure lager yeast from White Labs. But now I have been testing this with a lot of yeast and for the, for the testers I really read, they went up to like one bar and they tried lower than that. And what I read out the result was more like more the merrier, but someone else when they read it, got another opinion on the results. But I have been doing this for like three years now with a lot of different yeast, dry yeast, a lot of different um, uh, liquid yeast. I have done it from uh, yeast I have uh, cultivated from store-bought bottles and I have found that's not accurate at all. I haven't found yeast yet that has struggled under pressure. So uh, if you have found yeast that actually do struggle under pressure, please let me know. I would gladly try it out, but uh, yeah, I haven't found a yeast yet that doesn't handle pressure. And when I say press pressure, I mean like 35 psi, 2.4 bars. Cheers. The next question is about the same. I've read several places that fermenting above one bar, 15 psi, will greatly reduce yeast growth and produce acildehyde. Would you consider doing a split batch test to verify or debunk the myth? Uh, I would love to do that, of course. Um, I don't have like a big brewing system yet. Uh, I do have a lot of like fermentation bubbles, so I could try it out. I have just one fridge, of course, but yeah, I could do, do like two in at room temp and try that out as soon as I get a bigger brewing system. Produce Acildehyde? No, no, no. Uh, that that's just that's just wrong. And um, yeah, I do pick up acildehyde quite easy. And no, that's a myth. Next question: At what temperature should I ferment at under pressure? I would recommend with a new yeast. I I do start at the 
high temperature of the recommended to just yes, to learn it. So look at the recommended temperature, start at the, the high number there and go from there. You can push it really, really up and uh, yeah, I will keep on experimenting with that here on my channel. So consider becoming a subscriber. This video is sponsored by Brogoat. Brogoat is a Swedish homebrew supply and they just opened their brand new store here in Stockholm, Sweden. So go and check them out. I think they might have the best service opening times here in Stockholm. Might I even say Sweden. So go check them out. Cheers and thank you Brogoat for your support. Next question. When is the Fermented King unit coming to Europe? I don't know, but this spring it should come, but I don't have an exact date yet. As soon as I get it, I promise I will let you know. And if you don't know what Fermented King Junior is, you got it right, you will find the link down below. Next question, which fermenter do you recommend? I will go the easy route. I will recommend the uh, Fermenter Source Snub Nose. It's, it's so easy and I have been using the ferment stores for years, so I, I know it's a good investment. Uh, but you can say it like this, if you want the big opening, the Firmzilla or Rounder, you could get that. If you don't need the big opening, I would go for the ferment stores. It's the easiest one to go with. And of course, there's also the Fermented King Junior, but it's not yet available everywhere. I've heard that some yeast are sensitive to pressure. Yes, I have heard that also, but uh, I haven't found a yeast, as I said earlier, that are. So if you have a sp specific yeast, please let me know. We can get started uh, some conversation about that. I heard that quark yeast is sensitive to pressure. Um, quark is a beast and quark is not a yeast. Quark is an old name for yeast and most like quark uh, varieties ain't a single strain of yeast. They are uh, like a bunch of strain of yeast. And yes, there are single strain commercially now, but to me it's not really quark. I don't think that quark yeast is sensitive to pressure either. If you have room with quark, you know quark is a beast. Okay, this is interesting. Why so fast? If you are not worried about the monetary aspect of tank time, why rush it? I guess, yes, because I can. I've done some stupid experiments, but I actually brewed a lager in three days and I have a five day lager. Try to link to all those videos down below. Uh, but yeah, the normal turnaround run time you could brew a beer at the weekend and you can drink it the next weekend if you're going under pressure and force it a bit. And yeah, you can really do that when you are making pressurized fermentation beers. But if you don't want to rush it, don't rush it. Uh, if you want your brews to take longer, don't rush it. But rushing it don't hurt the beer when you are fermenting under pressure. So Fermenta King Junior versus Cornelius kegs. Cornelius kegs are of course an alternative and it's great to do pressurized fermentation in. So try that out. The Fermenta King Junior, but it's see-through, it's cheap. So but yeah, if you have a keg, get started with pressurized fermentation. Plastic fermenters is bad for the environment. Plastic ain't awesome for the environment, but it ain't much material in one of these bubbles and uh, they are should last you a couple of years and uh, we're gonna come back to that uh, topic in, an, in another time because there are some stuff you can do with it. But yeah, let's make that a cliffhanger for another episode. But as I said, it ain't much material really. Um, so I'm guessing you're not buying uh, bottled water or buying uh, like soda or pet bottles because it ain't much materials if this gonna last you a couple of years, at least two years before you have to like change out the bubble or test it. 
how does a spanning valve work and how do I set it up? There are different kinds of spanning valves. Let me show you this one. I guess that answers another question. Why do I put pressure on the uh, bubble as soon as I get my wart in? Uh, one question here is why I do that? Doesn't the, the fermentation produce CO2 by itself? Yes, it does. But I do it to set the spanning valve. So I pressurize the vessel with the amount of pressure I want. And then I close the spanning valve and attach the spanning valve. And this one has a thermometer, so it goes down to water. And then I just open the spanning until this starts to bubble. If you have a more simple, you will have to like use your ear, your hearing. Uh, when it starts to bubble, or you can hear the gas escape, close it, and yeah, your spanning valve is set to the amount you want. Otherwise, you would have to wait for the fermentation to kick in and dial it in that way. But yeah, to me, this works really, really, really great. What PSI would you maintain while cold crashing to carb your beer properly and not over carb? Uh, the thing I do as like I said, if I'm at 2.4 bars and end up at 30 C, like, like say it's a USO5 beer, I might start at 22 and yeah, ramp it up. There I have a good amount of carbonation. And the thing, when I started cold crash, I just pull the spandit off and crash it down. And you will end up with a good amount of carbonation. If you need more, just put some gas on there, but at this amount of pressure, you rarely don't. How often should I swap out my bubble, the, the, main, the main body, there, because there's an expiration date printed on it? I think uh, it's supposed to last you for two years uh, before you should like test it, but yeah. So, okay, two years. When will there be a CIP lid that supports a rotating ball available for Firmzilla or K King Jr.? Um, when? I don't know. Uh, but I think we will be able to do some testing uh, with the Fermenti King. And also in the future, we might DIY something for it to fit the uh, from Silla maybe. So yeah, subscribe for that. What about wanted esters? <sighs> esters are more complicated and uh, it's not that you are not getting esters when you're fermenting under pressure, but you do not get like uh, these off flavors from when yeast are pushed too fast or when fermentation are really going crazy. But you do get esters. I've brewed wheat beers and I have brewed uh, English beers. I have brewed Belgian beers and uh, esters are more complicated. When I started brewing, I've learned that at lower temperature, you will get less esters, but that's not true for all of yeast. Yeah. It's like different esters. Yeah. And some yeast are cleaner when uh, you actually are a bit higher up in the temperature. And uh, one example is um, one yeast I have talked about before in the channel, it's the uh, Bella Saison, but I think it's a really interesting experiment. I tried a beer that was fermented at 17 Celsius and also tried a beer that was fermenting at 27 Celsius. And the 27 Celsius beer was actually the cleaner one. And if you're using USO5 and ferment it cold, it will really push some like peach esters, which you don't get um, when fermenting higher. So esters are a bit more complicated, but as I get into bigger sizes of brewing, bigger batches, we can do more split batches here on the channel and we could give the esters thing a really good try with, with a 
high pressure and low pressure. And as I said, I have been fermenting under 2.4 or 35 psi, 2.4 bars or 35 psi for a very long time with different kind of yeast and different beer styles. But I do, of course, because this is my channel, I want to take this to the, the max. So um, don't, don't know when, but in the future I will do some really stupid things and yeah, like ferment under four or five bars, something like that. And of course, if you have a yeast strain that you're saying it don't tolerate pressure, comment down below. As I said in the beginning, before we go like crazy and linking to other people's channel, and he says that, and they says that, and I also heard them say all of these things, but uh, yeah, maybe someone will instead link to my channel and say, I saw this guy try this. I have been trying this for years and I'm not like repeating what other people are saying because that's not the way for this channel. So if you aren't already, consider becoming a subscriber. Do hit that little bell and give this video a like if you want even more content. Why don't you check out my Patreon page for the Big Dr. Hans recipe book and I do like more vlog style there. And a big shout out to my Patreon, of course, Brew Goat for sponsoring this video. So cheers guys and thanks for watching. Dog to out.